Good morning, people of St. John's. It's so good to see all of you today. I have noticed that we have had a little bit tr of trouble on some previous calls with the unmuting and muting situation. So what we're gonna try today is instead of having me attempt to mute or unmute people, we're going to have you unmute yourself whenever that's needed. So that will be needed during the breakout session at the end of the sermon. And so I wanna make sure everybody knows how to do it. Um, if you are on a phone, you can unmute yourself by pressing star six and that should unmute you just if you're on a regular landline. But if you're on a smartphone or a computer or something where you're seeing the screen, there should be in the lower left of your Zoom window, a little button that says mute that you can press to mute or unmute yourself. That's the primary way. There are a couple alternatives, but let's practice that. Go ahead and unmute yourself now um, and we'll see, and I'll take a look and see if it looks like most people succeeded. Am I unmuted? Am I unmuted? Am I unmuted? <laughs> Thank you, Robert. That's so helpful. <laughs> you're going to be permanent. You're going to be permanently <laughs> muted. Ann, you got it. Hi, Ann. Can we hear you? Yes, I can. Awesome. Hear you. you got it. Um, I trust Stephanie knows how to do it. She's back on mute again. Um, <laughs> Chris, you don't want to hear my children screaming in the background. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> okay. So people on the phone, there are some people who it looks like it didn't work. So my understanding is that if you press star six, um, you should be able to unmute yourself. I hear somebody on the phone. Hello, phone person. Rachel, are you there? Rachel? There's somebody on the phone who is able to unmute themselves. Um, I'm hopeful that that's going to work for everybody. Um, yeah. All right. Oh, they just remuted themselves. That's great. Okay, good. So press star six if you're on the phone to be able to unmute yourself. Thank you. So let's all go back to mute for now and we'll see if we have better luck with getting people unmuted when they need to be today. We'll keep working on this together. It's a work in progress. Speaking of works in progress, I thank all of you for your comments about uh, whether you are interested in doing in-person worship. We had a pretty low percentage of people who felt comfortable doing indoor in-person worship. And so as a result, we are not going to be taking that on for the month of August. We're going to stay with our regular Sunday morning service at 930 on Zoom. This allows everyone to be able to participate together. Um, you know, whether you have a health concern or not, we can all be together on this call. We can also continue to sing and do all of our regular worship practices. There were some folks who were excited about doing something in person and um, of those or of the people who were interested in in person people were much more comfortable with outdoor than they were for indoor. So as a result, we are going to offer starting mid August we're going to offer the Saturday service outdoor um, right next to the church on the lawn on Park Avenue. So if you're really excited about getting to just be, do something in person again, I really encourage you to come to that Saturday night service. We follow the same structure that we do on Sunday morning. Uh, there's usually more discussion than there is on Sunday morning. Uh, but other than that, it's very much the same. We have um, communion, we have the gospel reading, we have prayers. We will not be doing singing, but we will do what we can to have some music incorporated in our outdoor service. So please join us for that. We'll let you know a start date. It'll probably be mid-August. It'll probably be the first one that we offer there. And then in terms of other small groups and renters, for renters in our building, we are working on a procedure both for our outdoor worship service and for renters in our building for pre-screening people. Um, doing temperature checks at the door, um, making sure we're doing contact tracing in case something we were to need to get in contact with people. So we're, we're creating some procedures for that and we are going to start allowing renters who are interested in meeting in person again uh, to uh, come 
use our building. And I guess I should say these are the tentative plans. This is a work in progress. Um, and so we're still open to, to more feedback. So please send an email either to me or to church office at stjohnswillmet.com if you'd like to give more input about this process or if you have any questions. We, these are our tentative plans and we'll be discussing more as a reentry team as well as discussing at the August council meeting. So thank you all for your patience and input. And I really appreciate uh, the, the number of people who are making safety a priority. It takes a lot of patience and strength to resist the urge to just give up on this whole social distancing thing. So I really appreciate the care that you're showing for one another um, and the way that you're looking out for the vulnerable folks in our community, the way you're looking out for yourselves and your own families. It shows great wisdom and uh, patience. And so I thank you. I thank you for that. All right. The only other announcement I have is that during the breakout time, um, when we discuss the sermon today, we're going to, I'm going to do my best to put the children in the same breakout group so that they can have some time to interact amongst themselves in addition to the uh, children's message. So if you have a child on the call with you, hopefully you can let me know that during the children's message. And if they, you know, hopefully we'll can come back or stick around for that part of the service. We'd love to have them be able to interact with one another. All right, thank you for continuing as each week to write your attendance in the chat if you can. Um, and we will begin with everyone on mute so that we can sing. Robert will lead us and we'll begin with the ringing of the bell so that we can center ourselves on God and on our worship this morning.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Beloved and sovereign God, through the death and resurrection of your child, you bring us into your kingdom of justice and mercy. By your Spirit, give us your wisdom that we may treasure the life that comes from Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Good morning, children of St. John's. Hello. Good to see all of you. I think I have a sense of who's out there. Um, I see that we have Ben, we have Amelia and Maddie. I'm not sure if Lila is sitting there or not. Um, no, not today. Okay. Um, we have Finney, we have Josh, and maybe William, not sure. Um, yes, hi, William. Anyone else that I'm missing? I think, I think that's our group today. Great. So, for our children's message today, I wanted to tell a story. Um, it is a story from the Bible, but I'm not going to read it straight out of the Bible. I'm going to just tell it to you in my own words. This is one of the assigned stories that we have for our, um, our Sunday today. So this is a story from the first book of Kings. So the book of Kings, what do we think the book of Kings is about? Got an idea? What's the book of Kings about? Kings. Kings, yeah, for sure, right? I try to give you a, an easy one to start. <laughs> yeah, the book of Kings is about some kings. And we have kings in the book of Kings, like King David and King Solomon. Maybe you've heard of some of those kings. Today, we have a story about King Solomon. King Solomon is the son of David. So David was king. He was a great king. He's known by many people. We have many stories about him being a good person and also doing not so great things. And then he has a son, Solomon. And when Solomon is pretty young, King David dies. And that means that Solomon becomes the king. And we don't exactly know how young he was, but some think people think he might have been as young as 12 years old when he became king. So what is 12, sixth, seventh grade, something like that? Can you imagine being king of a whole country when you're in like seventh grade? It's kind of crazy. So King Solomon has a really cool dream right after he's become king. He's uh, very young, maybe 12 years old, and he has a really cool dream and that's what the story is about. All right, so let's hear the story. Once upon a time, King David had a son named Solomon. And when David passed away, Solomon became the king. One day, Solomon was praying to God and he fell asleep. In Solomon's dream, God appeared to him. And God said, Hello, Solomon. I have come here today to grant you a wish. God comes and says, I will grant you any wish that you want. You get to pick. So I want you to imagine that you are the new king or the new queen and God appears to you. 
what would you wish for if you were a new king you were in like seventh grade you became king or queen what would you wish for if god appeared to you and offered you a wish joshua what do you think you would wish for something to help the people what something to help the people something to help the people cool that'd be a, that'd be cool Something to help the people. Mm -hmm. What might you wish for? Maddie, do you have an idea? As many wishes as I need. Aha, uh -huh, there we go. We got a smart one over there. As many wishes as you need. I like it. How about you, Amelia? You want to say anything? Yeah. Many wishes as I need or want. <laughs> as many wishes as you, oh, she's upping it. It's not just as many as you need, it's as many as you want. Got it, got it. How about you, Finney? What would you wish for if God gra granted you a wish as, as the young king? Um, I'd probably, I'd wish for more wishes. You'd wish for more wishes too. That's a, that's a slick one, yeah. God, God wasn't very smart. God wasn't, he did, God didn't put on that requirement that you couldn't ask for more wishes. How about you, Ben? What would you wish for? 100 tablets for the whole kingdom. 100 tablets for the whole kingdom. Very nice. When you say tablets, what are you talking about? Things you oh, can like, write on or what? No, like a tablet, like the video one. Like, oh, the one I modern own. day kind of tablet, yeah. not like <laughs> ancient stones with writing on them, like Ten Commandments tablets. You mean like the tablets we're watching Zoom on. I love it. You'd ask for 100 tablets to, to pass out so everybody could have their own tablet. <laughs> That's great. All right, so Solomon didn't end up wishing for any of those things, believe it or not. So are you ready to hear what Solomon wished for? So Solomon responded by God's question, what would you, what wish would you like me to grant? And Solomon said, oh God, you are so wonderful. You have been so kind to my father, David, and you've been so kind to me. And in order for me to be a good king, I wish that you would give me knowledge and wisdom. Solomon asked for knowledge or wisdom. It's a little unclear in the Hebrew which, what it, which it was, knowledge or wisdom, but we'll just go with both. Solomon asked for knowledge and wisdom so that he would know what was right and what was wrong and that he would have the wisdom to be able to lead the people well. So what do you think God did Solomon, when Solomon requested that? How do you think, what do you think God God did in response. Benny? I think he, uh, I think he gave him it, I guess. Yep, exactly. So God thought that was a pretty great wish. And God was like, you know what? Because you asked for such a beautiful thing, for such a wise thing, I'm absolutely going to give you that thing. I'm going to give you wisdom and knowledge, and I'm going to give you even more than that. You're going to be beloved. You're going to have all that you need and more. You're going to have an abundance, and your kingdom is going to flourish. So Solomon woke up from his dream and took with him that gift, that gift that God had given him wisdom and knowledge. And he was able to use that as he ruled the people. And unfortunately, even though Solomon had the wisdom and knowledge that God gave, Solomon wasn't perfect. Solomon did some bad things and some not very smart things. You raise your hand if you ever do some not very smart things. Do some things that are maybe below your intelligence level or your level of wisdom. Maybe you know you shouldn't do them or you know what really would be healthy for you and you don't do it anyway, right? A lot of us have more wisdom or knowledge than we actually act on, right? So Solomon asked for wisdom and knowledge, but he didn't always act on that so well. And we don't always either, but the, but the good thing is that God forgives us 
and God teaches us to forgive ourselves because forgiving ourselves is really important too. Please pray with me. Oh God, I ask you to make us like Solomon, make us people who constantly seek your wisdom and knowledge. Grant us the knowledge and wisdom that you granted Solomon so that we can do what is good and what is healthy for others and for ourselves. And I ask that when we make mistakes that you help us to forgive ourselves and that you help us to forgive others when they make mistakes as well. Amen. Thank you for joining me for the children's sermon. I hope you'll stick around so that you can uh, talk to one another a little bit more during our breakout groups later. We will go on to our first reading. A reading from Romans. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is in the mind, what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to, Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus put before the crowds another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. 
It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid and then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and brought it and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down and put the good into baskets and threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate out the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered. They answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out his treasure, what is new and what is old. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Matthew chapter 13. What a treasure trove of riches this chapter is. Today we read from Matthew 13 for the third week in a row and the final week. This chapter is filled with Jesus' teachings about the kingdom of heaven parables and metaphors of what the kingdom of, of heaven is like and how it comes into being in the world. As we know, the kingdom of heaven, as Jesus talks about it, is not so much the kingdom we enter when we die, but more the kingdom that is coming into being on this earth and in this history. I love the way Michael Fitzpatrick puts it. This kingdom is the society where the love of God is the ruling authority, drying all tears, healing all wounds, reconciling all enemies, flattening all swords into plowshares. The kingdom of heaven is the state of being where the love of God is the ruling entity. God's love is king. As we look around at the world that we live in, it is easy to spot places where God's love is not the ruling authority. We look to our political landscape and see elected leaders and lobbyists driven primarily by preserving their own interests and wealth. We look to our social communities and see individuals trying to outdo one another and prove their worth, whether it's by making more money, being more physically attractive, or always giving off an air of success and happiness. We look to our own hearts, deep within ourselves, and we find judgment of both ourselves and others, doubt in our own worth and goodness. This rule by anything other than God's love is tyranny. The tyranny of wealth, of perfection, of the sense of not being enough. The tyranny of fear, of racism, of violence, and of control. So often God's love is not in the driver's seat. And yet Jesus comes to tell us that this kingdom of heaven, this state of God's love as the ruling authority is just around the corner. The kingdom is heaven at heaven is at excuse me, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Jesus says. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus is reassuring his early followers. The community of Christ's followers is tired and frustrated. They wonder why their preaching so often lands on deaf ears. And Jesus gives them the parable of the sower, reminding them to continue spreading the seeds of the kingdom because there is good soil to be found. The Christ followers struggle to keep their community pure and united. And Jesus gives them the parable of the wheat and the weeds, which reminds them that wheat can produce good fruit even as it grows alongside weeds. And finally, 
the Christ followers wonder if their small and seemingly insignificant work is worthwhile. And Jesus gives them the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the yeast. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field, Jesus says. It's the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. For a little bit of context, you should know that the mustard plant is more of a bush or shrub than it is a tree. And in Jesus' day, it was considered to be more of a weed than anything else. The mustard shrub was looked at as something that took up valuable space in the field and would often be weeded away. Nevertheless, the mustard shrub has many, many branches, and as such, it can provide shelter and nurture for other creatures, such as birds of the air. Thus, the mustard seed is a parable of something small and seemingly insignificant, growing into a plant that offers a home for many. In some ways, it seems strange that right after talking about the wheat and the weeds, which we read about last week, Jesus uses a weed to represent the kingdom in his next metaphor. And yet in some ways, it is fitting. It keeps us on our toes for one thing, and it also shows us how Jesus' way of looking at the world is different for most peoples. Jesus does not use a tree of grandeur for his metaphor, such as the great cedar tree. Instead, he uses a humble shrub that embodies no stateliness, but nevertheless provides shelter and nurture for the creatures around it. This connection and communal good is what the kingdom of God is about. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. Once again, some background knowledge is helpful. The leaven that was used in Jesus' day is different than our modern day yeast. In Jesus' day, leaven was created by setting aside a portion of leftover bread and leaving it out to spoil. If it did not spoil enough, it would not accomplish its job as leaven in the next batch of bread. But if it spoiled too much, it would ruin the next batch, possibly even poisoning those who ate it. Because leaven was spoiled bread, it was widely recognized as a symbol of impurity, uncleanliness, and corruption. Leaven was not viewed as a beautiful holy thing, but as an unclean ingredient. And yet, without leaven, the bread wouldn't rise. So in this metaphor for the kingdom, we have something that is cast out, something that is spoiled or ruined, embedded in the mix, and its presence transforms the whole. It only takes a small amount of leaven to transform the dough into bread. Mixed with three measures of flour, this leaven would produce about 100 loaves, enough bread for a wedding feast. In both of these metaphors, the mustard seed and the leaven, we have images of growth and transformation. In the case of the mustard seed, something small and insignificant grows into a bush that is a home for many. In the case of leaven, something left over and spoiled transforms the mixture into food that can nourish a multitude. In both cases, there is surprising growth, surprising change. I can imagine that this would speak to a group of early Christ followers concerned about the small size of their movements, concerned that their own brokenness will keep them from changing the world. And yet, of course, we know what happens. This movement for the kingdom grows across the whole world. The movement that started with Middle Easterners spreads to Africa, Asia, Europe, and later the Americas. The movement that started with the poor and broken, the left behind of society, has transformed hearts, minds, and communities throughout history, leavening the bread of this world. 
it's exciting to think about, to wonder what tiny seeds in our lives, what moments, what feelings, what relationships, what practices might grow into something generative. It's exciting to wonder what broken or ruined aspects of ourselves and our world will ultimately transform our hearts and society. When I look at the world this way, I begin to see potential everywhere. Every moment is a seed. Every experience, leaven for the whole. In our discussion groups today, I'd like us to ponder these two metaphors. What mustard seeds have you seen grow into something beautifully unexpected? Where have you seen a small thing or a small group of people transform the whole? Think about examples in your own life, in the life of your family, in the larger world, and in history. As I prepare to break us into our groups, start thinking of these examples of mustard seeds and leaven that you can name and recognize. You can jot them down or just reflect internally. And once you're in your groups, I invite you to re continue reflecting and sharing with one another when you're ready. At this time, please go ahead and unmute yourself so that you can participate in the breakout groups. Again, uh, on the phone, you need to press star six and uh, unmute yourself. I'm going to, we have 30 people. Yeah. I'm doing the airplane. Then tomorrow. Creating the breakout groups while you can start thinking or jotting down ideas of leaven that you've recognized or um, oops, sorry, leaven or mustard seeds. So who am I trying to find? I'm trying to find Rasmussen's. And I'm trying to find, I'm gonna get the kids in the same group. Yay. If I can. <laughs> That's right, Penny. <laughs> all the little mustard seeds. <laughs> yeah. Right, we got all the mustard seeds in one group. I like that. Um, what group needs help or needs extra people? Probably seven. Nope, Baby, say back. Say hi, back. Oh, wait. <laughs> she should be in group two. Uh, I'm amazed that you can even do all this. <laughs> Thank you. I, uh, I'm confused. So I have Maddie, I have Stephanie, I have Rasmussen. Oh, I'm missing Finney. Where's your name, Finney? It's under Finney. Chris. It's under Chris. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Chris oh. and Finney. There we go. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. That'll Chris. be better. All right, so um, if you are on the phone, you're gonna be automatically sent to your group. If you're on a computer, you'll have to click join breakout group. And I will um, send out the, the discussion question once again um, so that you can remember what it was. But go ahead and go move, to your, move to your rooms. Bye, Grandma. Hi.
Mm -hmm. It looks like we've all returned. Please go ahead and mute yourselves again. Thank you for participating in the discussion or at least reflecting along with us, even if you weren't able to participate or chose not to. I've been thinking about many examples of mustard seeds and leaven, and I won't share them all with you, but just a couple I uh, think about the the mustard seeds that can be planted in the mind through thoughts. I have friends who often talk about the idea of being enough, it's how sometimes we're taught that we are not enough. And um, one of the things that I've been practicing lately is at the end of the day, when I'm feeling stressed out and feeling like there's more stuff that needs to be done, I tell myself that what I've done today is enough. And that small seed planted in my mind um, on a regular basis is, it's growing. It's, it's growing into a different mindset of um, my worth and a mindset of what, it changes what stresses me out and what doesn't. Um, and it helps me feel at, more at peace and more able to do productive things and less stressed about getting just as much done as possible. So there are thoughts that can be seeds. There's relationships that can be seeds. I think of parents and the, seed, the important seeds that are planted in childhood. Seeds like you are loved and you are worthy. Those seeds grow into something huge. They grow people into the kind of people who can provide care and comfort for others. And those are beautiful, beautiful forms of mustard shrubs. I'm also thinking of a, an example that's like a combination seed and leaven. I'm thinking of a church that sent many of its congregation members to a community organizing training where they learned to do a spiritual practice called one-to-ones where they have relational uh, conversations with other people in the congregation have one-on-one -on -one com conversations where they talk about what is most meaningful to them, what they care deeply about and what their deep passions are. And they're unusual sorts of conversations, but they're very beautiful conversations where we can get in touch with who we really are and who God is calling us to be. And at this church where they did that, this practice started to take off. Um, it took some intention at first, but then with time, more and more people in the congregation started doing one-to-ones. They started to identify things that they had in common, shared passions, and they ended up developing a program around affordable housing because they had so much shared passion about that. And then they became leaven. 
So they started as a seed and it started as a seed in their community, these one-to-ones and it grew. And then the community became leaven for the larger community of Portland, Oregon, um, where their community became a voice for change and affordable housing movement. They started to take action and change policies and initiate the development of new affordable housing units. So in that way, this small group of people had an impact on the whole community of Portland. There are many, many examples like this, examples of mustard seeds in our lives and in the world, examples of leaven in our lives and in the world. Sometimes the seeds are planted by accident, but other times they are grown on purpose. And so as we go today, I invite you to consider another question for reflection. What are some mustard seeds that you might like to plant in your life or in this world or in your community? In situations in your life or in the church or in the community that need transformation, what might be the yeast that has the potential to bring about that change? What are the small things that can grow in surprising ways? What are the small practices that we might choose to take on intentionally because we trust that God has the power to move them and to move us so that those things can grow beyond what we could do otherwise? Please pray with me. <coughs> oh God, I give you thanks for the surprises of growth and transformation in this world. I give you thanks that it only takes something very, very small, a very small beginning to grow into something beautiful and something more whole. And I give you thanks that the brokenness the leftover parts of the world can be leavened for the community, that they can produce change and be an important part of what helps us grow. I ask you to be with us as we live out of these parables, that we embody them by being mustard seeds and by being leaven to the world. Work within us, let your spirit lead us and bring us to your kingdom. Amen.
confident in your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Merciful God, your reign is revealed to us in common things, the mustard shrub, a woman baking bread, a fishing net. Help your church witness to the surprising yet common ways you encounter us in daily life. Lord, in your mercy. When your word is opened, it gives light and understanding. Increase our understanding and awe of your creation. Guide the work of scientists and researchers. Treasuring the earth, may we live as grateful and healing caretakers of our home. Lord, in your mercy. Hear As the birds of the air nest in branches of trees, gather the nat nations of the world into the welcoming shade of your merciful reign. Direct leaders of nations to build trust with each other and walk in the way of peace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. Your spirit helps us in our weakness and intercedes for the saints according to your will. Help us when we do not know how to pray. Give comfort to the dying, refuge to the weary, justice to those who are oppressed, and healing to the sick. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. You show steadfast love and direct us to ask of you what we need. Help this congregation ask boldly for what is most needed. Refresh us with new dreams of being your people in this place and time. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. People of God, for what else shall we pray this morning, either silently or aloud? I'd like to pray for Cam Wise. She and her family have requested prayers for her health, both her physical and mental health. God, I ask you to surround her with your love, give her strength, bring her healing, and bring her into health and wholeness. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. prayer. And I ask for your prayer uh, just for my family because we are facing difficult right now. Um, Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the Winnett family and the loss of their mother much too soon. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. I pray for parents and um, for teachers and administrators as everyone works to imagine how the school year is going to look, especially this fall. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. In you, our lives are never lost. Strengthen us by the inspiring witness of your people in all times and places. Embolden our witness now, and one day gather us with all your saints in light. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. prayer. In the certain hope that nothing <clears throat> can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also, and also with you. Peace be with you, everyone. Peace. Peace. <laughs> Hi, Lila. I hope you found it your way into your breakout group. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. And Rachel, are you there? Rachel? Rachel and I were in the same breakout group, except I never... Yeah. And I, oh, I'm so sorry. She might be choosing to just listen, you know, it's possible. She's maybe choosing to unmute herself. Okay. Um, All right. you never know. Well, I wound up as a, I wound up as a group of one. So that was interesting. Oh, <laughs>
it's okay. Sometimes it's good to be alone with our thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> right, Jane. <clears throat> Huh. Again. Did Robert fall off the call? Oh no, there he is. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them unto the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right. Right. Thanks and praise. At this time, I invite you to lift up your bread and hold it at eye level as it is blessed. In the night in which he was betrayed, arrested, and denied, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to all who were gathered there. The disciples, their spouses, their children, the cooks, the keeper of the upper room, the one who would betray him, the one who would deny him, the one who would doubt him, the ones who would abandon him, and the ones who would sit at the foot of the cross. And he said to them all, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this and remember me. You may set on the bread and pick up your cups. <laughs> Again, after supper, Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the release from sin. Do this and remember me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as our Lord Jesus taught us in the languages and translations of our hearts. Our parents in heaven, hallowed be, hallowed your, be thy name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, come. Your will, your be, will done. be done on earth, on earth as, as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us today give us this day our daily bread. bread. Forgive us our 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 as, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Save us from our time and time of trial. Deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We know that even though we are physically apart, Christ is present in this real and true gathering of the church and in this meal that we share together. I invite you to eat bread and drink from your cup, the body and blood of Christ given for you. Let us pray. Hmm. God of the welcome table, in this meal we have feasted on your goodness and have been united by your presence among us. Empower us to go forth sustained by these gifts so that we may share your neighborly love with all through Jesus Christ, the giver of abundant life. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Receive the charge and blessing. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faith hearted Support the weak and help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Creator, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit, bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. 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 Amen.
Go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.